Numbers chapter 22. We are continuing our Bible survey. Uh, we basically, two lessons ago, wrapped up looking at the five courses of punishment set forth in Leviticus 26 that provided an outline of Israel's history in advance. Uh, we probably did more than I originally wanted to do when I first decided to go through that material, uh, but I really do believe if those are, you, you took notes or something you referenced or you've got it in your mind, at least a fundamental outline, and uh, I don't know if I have our timeline up here, usually I have it first, but we don't, but if you have that timeline, I think there's some in the back there, that sets forth the five courses of punishment and set forth the books that correspond with those courses of punishment. And so once you're reading through the Old Testament, if you're reading through Judges, if you look down on that timeline, you see Judges, and you, and you go up, and you can see there's that one there circled. You're under the first course of punishment. And so those things will help you as you go through uh, the Old Testament. Um, we wrap that up, however. Now we're going back to the next book. Uh, we dealt with some uh, the middle wall of partition there in Leviticus chapter 11, and and uh, things that Paul's doing in chapter 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and I think 18, regarding what God de deemed unclean and clean that set up those ordinances of the law, the commandments, and separated Israel from the rest of the nations based upon if they did those things, if they performed those things. And so um, now we're jumping over to Numbers, and we're just going to be looking at this issue. We started it, just started it last week. Um, looking at it, but that's the issue of Balaam and Balak. Often the only thing that's brought up in connection with Balaam and Balak is, the, is an amazing part, but usually it's the only thing that's brought up in connection with when Balaam's on the, the donkey and uh, the angel of the Lord is there and the donkey can see him, but Balaam can't see it, and then the donkey ends up talking to Balaam. And everyone wants to touch on that because that's a wonderful story, and it is, and there's some wonderful things going on there. Um, however, that's not the main issue. That's just set in the context of what's going to take place after that. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. We are going to briefly touch upon that issue as we go down through Numbers chapter 22, uh, but that's mostly just, gonna, again, going to serve as the setting of the context of uh, the issue of Balaam and Balak. And don't let this issue pass you by. I didn't pick it out for just to pick it out. It is a highly significant issue in the Old Testament. It's something that you, we're going to eventually see. We're going to go through all the passages. And there's not a lot, but there's quite a few that, regard, that, are, that talk about Balaam and Balak. I've got to move this. It keeps blowing my page. That talk about Balaam and Balak. And it's going to be highly significant for the remnant out here during the day of God's wrath. And we'll look at all that as we go, go on. Before we do that, however, let's read Numbers chapter 22. I'll read verses 1 through 6. We'll pray, and then we'll commence our study tonight. Numbers chapter 22. Let's look at verse 1. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people, because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, and that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to open up the most precious gift that we have here on this earth, your word, the living words of the living God so that they can live within us. And we thank you for the whole canon of scripture, even though this isn't our information to us and, uh, and about us in this dispensation of grace, uh, Paul is going to look at the issue of who you are 
in your plan and purpose with Israel and the very issues that we'll see with Balaam and Balak, Paul will actually bring up in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. And so this, again, is an important passage, not only to understand in Israel's program, but to understand some of the doctrine that Paul gives us in our epistles that serve as our godly edification. And so, Father, we thank you that you not only gave us the doctrine for our godly edification through our apostle Paul in this dispensation of grace through Romans, through Philemon, but you've provided us all wisdom and prudence. You've provided for us all the scripture. And so we thank you for that, that we can rightly divide it, we can leave it in this context, and therefore gain the profit and the riches that are therein by not applying them to us, but uh, although uh, learning about them, learning about you, and learning about your program with Israel, uh, we can benefit greatly. And so we thank you for this time. I pray as we go forth, we set aside the cares and concerns, honestly attend to the matter at hand, the issue at hand regarding Balaam and Balak, and therefore receive all the profit and knowledge uh, that w as much as we're going to go through and get, uh, receive that much. And so we thank you uh, for tonight. I thank you for the saints for coming out and for their desire to learn more about you, uh, as spe specifically tonight in our Bible survey. And so we thank you for all these things. And most of all, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Um, before we get back into Numbers 22, I want to just survey real quick the passages. There's, I got six of them, and sorry, I got seven of them, and then we'll look at another issue that doesn't bring up in Balaam and Balak, but really it's what Balaam and Balak is, are doing. Uh, and it comes out here in the book of Revelation, in the book of the Revelation. Uh, so come with me as we do this. Uh, we're going to go in order. So come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Now, we're not going to touch upon the context of these passages very much. I just want you to see that once you pass Numbers chapter 24, it, God's not done bringing up Balaam and Balak. And um, when you have that amount of space, Numbers 22, 23, and 24, three whole chapters devoted to this issue, God's doing that for a purpose. And it's usually because there's something else that he's going to utilize them for, at least in what he's teaching with them there, he's going to bring it up again and again. And that's what I just want you to see. Look at Deuteronomy 23. Uh, let's pick it up here in verse 1. He that is wounded in the stones and hath his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way. When ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. Now when God is, is bringing them unto the land, when, before they go into the land, they're, they're going through nations. And as they go through nations, they would send some people out and say, can we pass by thee? We won't we won't take anything of you or anything like that. We just want to come pass by you. And really what they should have done, based upon what God did with them in Egypt and what he did with uh, some nations before that, where they came in, they should, have, they, would, should, they should have blessed them. They should have said, look at their God and what he's doing. And we should give them bread and water. But some of those nations didn't. And one of the things, instead of blessing them, they, they set about, in this context of Balaam and Balak, to curse them. And so God's bringing that up here again in regards to why they shouldn't do the things that he's commanding them here uh, in regards to the Ammonite and the Moabite. And that's who we're dealing with when we're dealing with Balak. He was the king of the Moabites. Okay? But nevertheless, he brings it up here again and it's specific because it's kind of one of those checkpoints or those markers or hallmarks of the Old Testament. Now come over with me to Joshua. Joshua chapter 13. Joshua chapter 13, and look at verse 22. 
Now, Joshua is the one that takes them into the land. Uh, we're going to see from Numbers 22 when they, that when they pitch their tent and set forward on this side of the Jordan before Jericho, is that's before they cross Jordan. And they're going to be where they're at in Numbers 22 all the way to the rest of Numbers and all the way to the end of Deuteronomy. And Joshua is going to be one that takes them into the land. God's going to, they're going to split the Jordan River just like he split the Red Sea for Moses. They're going to go in and then they're going to start to conquer the land under Joshua's leadership. And that's what they're doing here. And um, just notice what he's saying here. Look at Joshua 13 verse 22. It gives us some commentary of what we're going to be reading over there in Numbers 22, 23, and 24. Verse 22, he says, Balaam also the son of Beor, the who? Soothsayer. Did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them? They go in, and remember, he's in, the, he's in the east, and they call him over and things like that, and they slay him. That's what ends up, what's a, what ends up eventually happening uh, to Balaam. Come over to chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. And look at verse 9. Let's pick it up in verse 8. Joshua 24 and verse 8. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son, of, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And again, this is going to become a highly significant issue through Israel's history because of what's going to take place Balak wants to gather a company of nations together to curse, to curse Israel and destroy them. Not just one nation, but a company of them to destroy Israel. And that's significant because when they start to go into the land and conquest under Joshua's leadership and onward, when the day of wrath comes and the Lord comes and does it, one of the things that God's going to say, and we looked at the passage, we're about to go over there and look at it again, but remember what I said to, to Balaam and that he communicated to Balak that there's no nation or nations that can confederate together that can thwart my plan and purpose with you in the sense of me not fulfilling it. And that's supposed to do some wonderful things within the, children, the Israelites, specifically that little flock out here, is that man, look at all the nations round about us that are against us and God told a false prophet back then, Balaam and Balak, that there's nothing they can do to thwart it. That's supposed to give them some comfort. That's supposed to give them some hope. And to see that God will uh, fulfill his plan and purpose with them. Come over with me to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. You got First and Second Chronicles there. Ezra, Nehemiah. When you're with Nehemiah, let me see if I can just skip through here real quick. When you're reading Nehemiah, where are we here? Right here. You're in the fifth course. Of, you're all the way over here. We just dealt with Joshua back here. We just jumped all the way over here with Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? And he's still going to come up, okay? Nehemiah 13. Let's just look at verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water. They, with Nehemiah, if you remember what's going on with Ezra and Nehemiah, they go, they're out of the land under... Babylonian captivity under the first installment of the fifth course of punishment. I should become familiar with you now. Under the second installment of that fifth course, they're going to go back into the land. They're going to go back into the land and they're going to start to rebuild their temple and they get that law and they start reading it and one of the things they read is, is what's founded in that law from, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. The, the book of the law as it were. And they read the passage that we, that we just saw over there in Deuteronomy. 
And, and my understanding is they probably understood some things regarding what Joshua did in all those things. And that's supposed to give them hope. And he says, uh, he goes on, Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And so that's, a, again, a highly significant issue. Out of all the things that they're reading, one of the things they're highlighting is what God said about the Moabites and the Ammonites in context regarding Balaam. Okay? Uh, come with me to Micah now. This is the one we started off with last lesson. Micah chapter 6. Right after Jonah there. The minor prophets. Micah chapter 6. Again, Micah is right here. And so you go, boop. He's under the fifth course of punishment. And he's prophesying about the, what, what's going on at that time and what's going to be taking place in the remaining installments of that fifth course of punishment. Okay? So he's, Micah's, Micah's around here looking out here. Looking out here, okay? And look at one of the things that he prophesies. Micah chapter 6, verse 1. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. He's got a controversy with them because of their disobedience. Verse 3, O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. And they can't testify against him. He's, he's, uh, he hasn't wearied them. They've wearied him, really. Verse 4, For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, what's that next word? Remember now. This is going to be a prophecy that that little remnant out here, during the day of wrath, they're going to go back and read Micah, who was prophesying about at this time, regarding this time that they're in, and they're going to hear, they're going to read these words. Oh my, uh, oh my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted. And what Balaam, the son, and what we're going to see, what they consulted is to gather a company of nations against them. And the reason why they're going to have to remember that is because that's what's going to be, this, we're going to look at it in Revelation, that's, that's what's going to be the satanic policy of evil against them at that time. In fact, the Bible tells you the exact nations that are going to be against Israel. And they're going to confederate with the Antichrist to come up against him. And he says, remember what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. And, what, and that's what we're going to look at, what, Moab, what, the, what the king of Moab, Balak, consulted, and what Balaam, Balaam answered. And that, he doesn't give you that all right there. And so we would have to go back to Numbers, and they'll have that too. And that's what we're going to eventually take a look at. I was giving you a feel for the importance of this passage in, in Numbers. Come with me now over to Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter 2. Now when you're in Second Peter, go all the way over here. And if Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, you're under that fifth and final installment of that fifth course of punishment. They're right at the end. And look at one of the things he's going to bring up. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now he, he starts, well he's, he basically, well he starts in verse 1. Look at, the, look at what he's dealing with in chapter 2. He says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. He's talking about false prophets. That's who Balaam is. And eventually he's going to go down. He talks about a lot of things going on. One of them is that they despise governments, and they, they, lust of, uh, of their, they walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness uh, in the specific way that they are. In verse 12, he calls them natural brute beasts. But then pick it up here in verse 14 as he's describing them. These false prophets at this time. Okay? The Lord says that in Matthew 24 as well. 
In fact, hold your hand here and look at that. I'm sorry. I, just, I got to make these connections and give them to you because to me, I look at them and I say, wow, look how it all is connected. And it, and it just, it is. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Hold your hand there in 2 Peter and look at Matthew 24. The very prophets that Peter's talking about, the false prophets at that time, are the very ones that the Lord talks about here in Matthew 24 on the Mount of Olives. Um, look at verse... He brings it up quite a few, time, a few times. Um, let's just pick it up here in verse 10. He says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many, who? False prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And so those false prophets, because the Lord, what he's talking about, the, the disciples right here, the apostles asked them, what's the sign of the end? Or what's the sign of your coming? He's talking about that fifth installment, when he's going to come back. And the Lord comes along and says, here's what's going to take place. Then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, and then I will return. And one of the things involved in all that, look at verse 24 as well. He says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and, sh and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And so false prophets. Remember that parable that the Lord gives regarding the wheat and the tares? And they both come up together? We'll see that here in a little bit in Revelation. We'll come back to 2 Peter chapter 2 now. So those false prophets is whom Peter is dealing with. And in that context, look who he brings up. Verse 14, 2 Peter chapter 2. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable, stole, unstable, unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of who? Balaam, the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Now, he's bringing up some things before he gives the, he gives the messages to Balak from God, but... Nevertheless, he still brings up Balaam here. And he's describing the false prophets at the time. are just They followed the way of Balaam. This guy all the way back in, in Numbers. Come with me to Jude. Jude. Right before Revelation. Jude chapter, well there's only one chapter. But chapter 1. And look at verse 11. Very similar issue here. Jude Verse 11 it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of who? Balaam for reward and perished in the game, saying, Of course, wouldn't it be wonderful to understand what he's talking about there? To me, when I read that, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to go back and figure this out, find this out. Well, that's what we're about to do. Look at, look at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, John's caught up. And he is seeing what's going on, what's being signified regarding the Lord's day here. And the Lord comes along and he, he says, speak these things to the seven churches. He gives, he gives the things to the seven churches. All, by the way, in my understanding, are people justified unto eternal life. But there's something that they are lacking or something that they aren't supposed to be in. And so the Lord's correcting them here. Uh, but look at Revelation chapter 2, and look at, uh, just for time's sake, look at verse 13. Uh, look at verse 12, he starts there dealing with the church of, of uh, per per Pergamos. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Now, you have to understand that whole parable of the wheat and the tares. Because that's what's going on here in Revelation. You have a, a church that's going to be at this time, a group of believers during the Lord's Day of Wrath. But one of the things that the adversary has done, he's put a, a synagogue right next to them. And some of those people are coming in. 
and infiltrating that, the, the, the little flock, as it were. And he calls them, he, he, he talks about the synagogue of Satan. You can read the letter, the, the information regarding these churches, but that's what he brings up. And so that's what he's doing here. And that's where Satan's seat is. And he says, And thou holdest fast my name, and hast, deni and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of who? Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now that's going to go out a little bit farther than what we're dealing with, but again, he's bringing up the issue of Balaam. And then he says, who hold the doctrine of Balaam. And there's some things regarding the doctrine of Balaam and what he was involved in regarding the enchantments and things like that that they need to get away from. They're not saying that they're involved in it, but there's some there that hold to it. In my understanding, those are Satan's men, and they got to get rid of them. they got to get them out or get away from them. Now come with me to Revelation chapter 13. And I want you to see what the adversary tries to do with Balaam and Balak is what he resorts to in his final plan to try to destroy Israel. And that's the issue of having him and a false prophet, the, anti the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the false prophet confederate with some nations against Israel. And that's what's being brought up here in Revelation uh, chapter 13. Let's just get a feel for it here. Look at verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. This is all, this is all in accordance with what the visions given to Daniel and the beast and, and, and the ten horns coming up and things like that. And look what he says here. Uh, the beast shall rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Ten nations, okay? And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Remember that phrase right there. Who is like unto the beast? Write it down or dock it in the back of your mind, okay? Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them, and power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb that slain from the foundation of the world. Jump down to verse 12. Look at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the be first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he hath power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he goes on and talks about the beast and the dragon. And what you have there is the Antichrist and the false prophet working together with the confederacy of the nations that represented by the ten horns. And one of the things he's going to do is speak great blasphemies. Um, look at verse 18, the last verse. He says, Here is wisdom. Let, them, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 603 score and 6. 666. Folks, that's, you know, that's not going to be the issue of <laughs> you're going to get 666 on your hand or your forehead, as everyone says. That would that'd just be too obvious. I mean, but the, but the number is the number of a man. Well, what's, 
What's one of the things that the Antichrist, who is a man, is going to say that he's God? And my understanding regarding that is, is that three times the Antichrist is going to eventually result in the epitome of it, that I am God, but he's going to declare that he's God three times. And God is coming along and three times saying, no, you need to listen, he's just a man. And so that's not the, that's not the issue, at least in my understanding, it's not the issue of you're going to get a 666 on your hand or your forehead or implanted in you somewhere. To me, that's just, everyone, unbelievers know the mark, the, the mark of the beast is 666. What's going to mark him is that he's going to claim, proclaim that he's God. And really, he's just a man. Well, anyways, that's what's going to take place out here. As the Antichrist is going to reign to power, have his false prophet with him, and he's going to confederate with these, he's going to be in, uh, in a company with these ten horns, and you'll see, we'll go through it, it's going to be ten nations to be against Israel. Now, that issue, we're going to see it in tight form. It actually really happens, but nevertheless, tight form all the way back here. Let's begin to look at it now in the remainder of our time. Come back with me to Numbers verse, chapter 21. Numbers 21 first. Again, Numbers, it's named Numbers is because what's going on is there's a consensus going on or a, a, I'm sorry, a, a, a census going on, not in regards to how many people, but regarding the armies of Israel to take stock of all the men that can go to war. And one of the things that they're doing is, is they're, they're going up to where they, to get ready to go in and conquest the land. That's why they need to get their armies ready and all these things. And, but before they get up to that spot, uh, let me, I don't know if this map is going to work, so... For, forgive me if, it, if you can't see it. But um, what you have is Jerusalem down here, okay? And then you have the, the Jordan over here, okay? Jericho is right here. And then the Jordan's right here. Israel's over here. They're on this side of the Jordan, right before Jericho. That, and they pitch out over here, all the way until the end of Deuteronomy with Joshua, okay? And they're pitched there, but before they, come, before they pitch there, they're, they're coming up from down here. They're, they're coming up. And they're going into these nations. They fight with the, the, uh, the Amorites and, 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 uh, and things like that. And they're coming. And God's also doing something very specific. And I wanted to just show you that. Uh, I brought it up last time. I didn't have the reference off the top of my head. Look at Numbers 21. Numbers 21. And look at um, verse 10. Now, they'll, when, when God's presence, presence goes before them, they'll, they'll pack up everything and go, go follow after him, and then his presence will reside somewhere, and then they pitch there and they set the tabernacle for however long it is. But look at, look at verse 10 here. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth and pitched in Jabarim, and the wilderness which is before Moab, toward the sun rising. From thence they removed and pitched in the valley of Zered. From thence they removed and pitched on the other side of Arnon, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coast of the Amorites. For Arnon is the border of Moab between, the Mo, uh, between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore, now here's, get verse 14. God's not bringing them to these places for a haphazard reason. He's bringing them to these places because this is eventually when the Lord returns the places he's going to make war with the people. Look at what he says here in verse 14. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord. And that book is before God in the third heaven. It's, this is what's written there. What he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon and at the stream of the brooks that goeth down to the dwelling of Ar and lieth upon the border of Moab. And from thence they went to Beer that it... Uh, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. And what I want you to see is the books of the war, the wars of the Lord. Those are all things, that, those are all wars in which when he comes back, he's going to have. And he's bringing them to them, those spots to teach them all that. So everywhere, even where they're going is not insignificant, but rather significant to an issue 
mostly out here when God fulfills his plan and purpose with Israel. Well, I just wanted to give you that because I said I, I, I mentioned that before. But come with me to Numbers 22 now. Numbers 22. And look at verse 1. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jer Jericho. And so they're, they're in the plains of, of Moab here on this side of, of Jordan. Okay? And then he, and then he, look, and then he says, um, by Jericho. So Jericho is right here. They're on the other side of, of Jordan there. And, and they're... What I want you to see is they're on the other They're not in the land yet. They're not valley with Jericho yet. They've just pitched there. They're on the other side, okay? And that's significant because they're ready. They're in a... The, 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 uh, the census of the armies are ready. He's taken them and, and, and taught them about the wars of the Lord and things that are going to take place. And now they're about to go in and conquer the land. And they pitch there. And they set forward. That's what they're looking towards. They set forward to it. And look what takes place. And, and what's going on is you, Israel's over here on this side of the Jordan. And what's going on with, Moab, with the king of Moab regarding Jordan is some things on the other side of, of, of looking at what Israel is going to be doing. Okay? And he gets scared. Balak, the son of Zippor. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were, they were many. I'm sorry, Israel, Israel's coming up. They're not, Moab's not in there. Moab, Moab's down here. So they're, 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 they're coming up, okay? Here we have the plains of Moab right there. I finally saw it. I couldn't see it before. The plains of Moab. So they're, they're coming up. They're, they're over here and, and on this side of Jordan. And they're coming up to Moab to, to enter in there. And then that's where they're going to cross over the Jordan over by Jericho there, okay? And Balak the son of Zippor saw all Israel had done to the Amorites. They just defeated the Amorites and they did some things with, uh, with Bashan and, and before with Amalek. They had already done some war and Balak hears all this and he's sore afraid of the people, verse 3, because there were many. Look at verse 4. And Moab said unto elders of Midian, so now he's reaching out to other, another nation and the elders of the nation. And look what he says when he's trying to, the Moab is trying to gather the Midianites with him. He says, now shall this company, the company that he's getting together, lick up all that are round about us. And that's the issue of, that's, that's Israel. Look up round about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. He wants to get, his, uh, he wants to get the Midianites and go into cahoots with them go and be against Israel. But look at what they're going to do. Verse 5. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pithor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, the cover the, that they cover the face of the earth, they abide against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. They knew the exact guy to get the job done, to curse Israel. This wasn't, who's Balaam? With the, with Balak's not come along and saying, well, let's just try to find a guy to curse a false prophet. No, they know who Balaam is. And the Midianites, too, they're not coming along and saying, well, who's this guy? Is he, can, he, can, he curse, can he really curse them? No, they're, they're getting the guy. They're getting the chief false prophet at this time. And he says, for they are too mighty for me, verse 6, peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land further explanation and amplification of how that's going to get done. For I want that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. That's a counterfeit of the Abrahamic covenant. And the issue, what's involved there, remember when the Abrahamic covenant, those that bless you, I will bless. Those that curse you, I will curse. That, those are nations. The nations that bless, it can be done on an individual basis too, but na the nations that bless Israel, God will bless. So nations are involved here, and what this false prophet is able to do, Balaam, is get the nations together. He has the power. He can tap into his source of gods. And we're going to see with all his enchantments and familiar spirits, 
tap in and get his gods to work to get the nations together to curse Israel and go up against them. And that's what he that's what he's that's why they're getting them. He's got he's got resources that Balak and the elders of the Midianites don't have. And that's what they're trying to get. Verse 7, and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake un, unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night. I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is, come a people, uh, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be... Uh, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. So far, so good. Okay? But look. Verse 14, And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak, and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. So he sends the princes back. And he says, Balaam refused to come with us. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more, uh, and more honorable than they. So he's, he's upping the ante, as it were, of the honorable princes. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to persuade them with honor and, and riches. That's why Peter and Jude come along and say the, the reward of Balaam and the wages of unrighteousness they're trying to get him with riches. And that's going to be significant out here at the little remnant because guess what? They're not going to have riches. They're not going to have anything at that time. They're not going to be able to buy and sell because of what, what's going to be going on. And so they need, to under, they need to understand, don't go after the way of Balaam who, who did things for, for riches so, and, and honor, worldly honor. Verse 16, And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto thee. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. He's pretty desperate. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore I pray you, tear ye also here uh, this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, and, and that whole issue, don't get caught up the issue of, uh, of the Lord my God. He's not the only my God that he has, okay? The issue with Balaam is he's just, he, God, the most high God, is just one of his many gods that he worships and that he's after, Okay? Verse 20, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them, but yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Now he shouldn't have done that. He was only supposed to go if they called him. They didn't call him. But he went anyways. My understanding is he's persuaded with the riches, the wages. And that's why verse 22, a lot of Bible scoffers pick that passage and say, why, well, why is God angry? He told them to go. He told them to go only if, he, if they call for him. And they didn't call for him. He just went. Or at least there's no indication that he, they called for him. And that's why God's angry, verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants with him. And you know the rest of the story. He ends up trying to go this way and that way, and he's and he's and he's beating the, the, the ass there, and then the ends up the ass ends up talking to him. Shrek and Donkey weren't the first donkey to ever talk. I don't know if you know what Shrek is, but <laughs> anyways. Well, that's what ends up taking place. What ends up happening is Balaam goes onto Balak. Now look at chapter 23. Before you get to chapter 23, look at the last verse of chapter 22. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him into the what? High places of who? Baal. 
the adversary, his places, their high places. And that's where they would do their worship. That's where they would set up their altars, do their sacrifices. They would have the groves and be involved in all the immorality that, that, that the Gentiles would be a part of. And he says that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. And so they're in a high place looking, gain a view of the people of Israel. Okay? Now look at chapter 23, verse 1. And Balaam said in the Balak, Build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak said as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered and offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. Then Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy burnt offering, and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to an high place. And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, Now, before you before we go on, I want you to see something. Again, he's not just trying to he's not just gonna commute He's not just trying to communicate with the Lord. He's, he's trying to communicate with the gods. Okay? And I want you to see that over in chapter 24, because it's going to be brought up. But look at chapter 24. Look at verse 1. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not, as at other times, to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And the issue of enchantments, that's not the way in which you communicate with God by enchantments. That's the way in which you communicate with gods. Small g. The, the angelic realm. The adversary and his devils. With enchantments and the familiar spirits. And that's why Joshua came along and told in regards to Balaam, he was a soothsayer. And he was involved in the, in the satanic policy of evil. And what it could do amongst the nations as he has as he's the prince of the world. And so what's, what's, what's taking place is he goes up in the high place and they sacrifice and they do all the, uh, the preliminary issues to tap into the gods. Guess who intervenes? The Lord God. The Most High God. And he doesn't, get, he doesn't tap into anyone else but this guy. This guy. God. That's all he can get. That's all he can hear. And that's what's going to end up taking place. And look at verse 4. And God met Balaam and said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus shalt thou speak. Now here's the first message. Okay, There's four messages. The first one is, the theme of it is Israel is God's separated nation. The second one, God is not lying nor repenting. Or, and, and is not repenting. The third one, God will fulfill his plan and purpose with Israel. And the, the fourth one, nothing that the Gentiles can do can thwart it. So let's look at the first one here. Verse 6. This is why you should speak to him. And he returned unto him, and, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, had brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east. Now we're not going to be able to eventually, we're not going to deal with that, but eventually we are. So keep that geographic location in your mind, the east, okay? Saying, come curse me Jacob and come defy Israel. That's what they want to do. They want to defy Israel. They want to curse Israel and destroy them. Verse 8, how shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the tops of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. And the main thing I want you to get there is that last expression, verse 9, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. They're his separated special nation. And that's looking at it from God's perspective. The issue of the top of the rocks I see him, from the hills I behold him. They're everywhere. And they're, they're not to be reckoned among the nations. Verse 10. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? And look what he says here. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. That kingdom. And the death of the righteous. Justification and, and life. And it's interesting that Balaam says this. He wants it, but he's not going to go after it God's way. He's going to persist in his way. Which eventually is going to come the way of Balaam. With, with the, he, wants, he wants the wages of unrighteousness. That's why eventually he gets destroyed by Joshua. 
but nevertheless he wants it. And basically he's magnifying God and what, what's all involved with the Lord God in whom is given this message for him to speak to Balak. And, and hopefully that they would both and the princes of Moab that are there would positively respond. And instead of wanting to curse them, to bless them. Verse 11, And Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them all together. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And Balak said unto him, Come, and I pray thee, with me unto another place from whence thou mayest see them, that thou, see, uh, that thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and shall not see them all, and curse me them from thence. You have to understand the context. Those are the very first, at least my understanding, the very first words Balak has ever been given, communicated to him from the Lord God. So he's thinking, well, let's try to change his mind. Let's go to a different place. Let's do it here. And, and, and I want you to, because the first one, he says, the top of the rocks I see him, and the hills before, behold, I behold, he's everywhere. Let's go over here. Let's not see all of them, just a portion of them, and let's do this. Let, let's get this done here. And that's significant, the context, because of what the next message is going to be. Now jump down. They do the offering and the sacrifice again. Look at verse 16. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and say thus. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. Here, come right here and stand and listen. That, that's the terminology. Hearken unto me. Rise up and, and hearken unto me. Okay? Verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall it not be uh, shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandments to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel, and the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Now there's so much stuff right there. The issue there he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. You've got to understand that the, the backdrop of all this is that they've been in the wilderness for 40 years based upon their unbelief and disobedience. There's great perverseness and iniquity in Israel. But what he's starting to look at is God knows what's going to take place with that and what it's going to do to Israel's iniquity. And basically he's teaching them that even Israel's own perverseness is not going to thwart God fulfilling his plan and purpose with Israel. That's an amazing thing right there. That's an amazing issue regarding the God in whom we serve in the dispensation of grace. The same God back here in Israel's program talking about not even their iniquity. Paul's going to bring up a similar thing to that in Romans chapter 8. When we want to walk in this life and, and we're going to partake in the instruction he gives us, he knows we're going to fail. He knows we're going to screw up. And he's provided for it. So that not even our iniquity, not even our mess-ups, can, can, if we avail ourselves of the provision he's made, thwart what he wants us to be, and that is to be conformed to his image. Well, that's what's going on here in Israel's program. And, but look at, jump back up there in verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. I'm not going to change my mind. You're trying to get me to change my mind, going over here and only viewing Israel in a specific part. You think, you think, you don't understand who I am. You don't understand I'm not like man, nor am I like the son of man. I don't lie and I'm not going to change my mind. I'm not going to repent. And he comes along, and look what he goes on to say there, verse 21, halfway down. He says, the Lord his God is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. That's going to be the, the Lord Jesus Christ. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, he hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. A unicorn is, is, uh, would be a symbol of strength, especially in the east where they are, an oriental description of, of strength. 
And he goes on and he says, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? It's, it's, it's wonderful. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the, of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. He can't do anything but speak what God says. He can't, his enchantments aren't working. His divinations aren't working. He can't get them to work. He can't access any of his other gods that he normally accesses on a daily basis. And the only thing that he can get is what the Lord God, the Most High, gives him. And he says, first, he says, my nation is a separate nation. They're special. And he says, me fulfilling my plan and purpose with them, I'm not lying. And I will not change my mind. And no one will get me to change my mind. Paul's going to bring that up in Romans 9 in regards to will God fulfill his plan and purpose with them? So the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He's not going to change his mind. He will fulfill his plan and purpose with Israel. And if people back here, theologians and scholars today, understood what's going on with Balaam and that God is not man that he, can, that he, he would lie, nor the son of man that he should repent, would know that God has to, based upon his character and essence, his fidelity and who he is have to fulfill all the promises that he promised to Israel. And he will. Well, we're going to stop there. We'll deal with the third one. And because of a negative response of the third one, there's a fourth message. And when we deal with that fourth message, what we're going to see is a significant issue regarding a star. And we're going to trace that issue of the star all the way through the scriptures and see it come about during the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, not only when he's born, but when he's around two years old. And we're going to see some wise men who understood this prophecy from Balaam and Balak. Another passage, when you get to Matthew and Luke, talking about the Lord's, specifically Matthew there, I'll reference Luke for a specific reason, but when you get to Matthew, that whole issue of the star, you don't understand why there's the issue of the star if you understand the issue of Balaam and Balak in, in Numbers chapter 24. A beautiful, wonderful issue. And um, we'll look at that more next time. Let's pray to conclude. Father, we thank you for this time to get through two of the four messages given to Balak through the false prophet even though what he's saying here now is not false, because of God's power and his ability being the most high God and being who he is, the creator of all things, being able to have authority to be able to, to for Balaam to not tap into the devils that, that the devil has, that the adversary has, and to override all the enchantments and the divination to preach a message to Balak that a company of nations, a nation alone nor a company of nations can thwart what God and, and, and can thwart God's plan and purpose, your plan and purpose with Israel. And that fidelity and that strength and that power to fulfill a purpose and a plan that you have it's highly significant to our dispensation of grace and what you're doing with us. That this issue that you cannot that you should that you should not lie and that you that you cannot repent as far as change your mind and a plan and purpose that you have is also beneficial beneficial for us to understand. And that you will fulfill your plan and purpose with the church of the body of Christ. But not only that, we see a wonderful issue here in regards to your people Israel, in regards to something, to an issue that you'll constantly bring up as we looked at tonight, as Israel's history advances on. Ultimately, so it would be a great time, a great comforting issue as they remember it during your day of wrath, when the epitome of what Balak tried to do here is fulfilled with the Confederate nations with the Antichrist 
come up against them. And so we thank you for being able to understand this and see your faithfulness in this matter. Father, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone's listening, they have not trusted that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. Before they need to understand any of this, any of that we're looking at, they need to understand that and believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again to offer the complete payment of their sins as a free gift. And the way in which they receive this free gift is not by any works, but by faith and faith alone. And the moment God sees their, God sees their faith trusting in Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, He'll justify them unto eternal life. Meaning they'll, He'll forgive them all their sins, past, present, and future. And He'll impute His righteousness unto them, and they will therefore possess the gift of eternal life. May they believe this very moment. We thank you for this time of grace given. We don't give grudgingly or out of necessity, but willfully and cheerfully according to the effectual working of your word in us. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen.